Hey, hello. Um, I think we are all here and we may now get started with our uh, panel for this particular judicial election. Welcome to this Judicial Candidates Forum, co-sponsored by the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, judgeforyourself.com, and the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. I'm Catherine LaCroix. I'm co-president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, and I will be your moderator. The candidates for this forum are Richard Bell and Wanda Jones. Um, our candidates are seeking a two-year term on the Court of Common Pleas General Division. This court has general jurisdiction to hear civil cases where the claim is more than $15,000. So that includes property, contract, personal injury, and other types of civil claims. The type of thing you think of when you say, I'm filing a lawsuit and I'm going to court. You end up in the Court of Common Pleas. Also, very importantly, this court has jurisdiction over felony criminal cases. In order to qualify to be a judge on this court, a person must be an attorney admitted to the practice of law in Ohio with at least six years of ex legal experience in this state. Our procedures today will be pretty simple. I'm gonna start the questioning by randomly choosing a candidate to speak first. After that, we will rotate between the two candidates for who answers first. I'm going to be using a set list of questions I regret that due to the short time period for this forum, there will be no additional questions from the audience. Each candidate will have one minute to answer a question unless it's a longer question, in which case I'll tell them they have two minutes. Um, we will have no rebuttal. Our timekeeper um, will display a card with a 10 second warning and then a card that says stop. I believe that the way our Zoom technology is working our candidates can see the timekeeper, uh, but the audience cannot. So uh, please be assured that timekeeping is occurring. I'm going to ask as many questions as we can to fit into the time for the forum. Um, just pausing for a moment, do our, pan do our uh, candidates have any questions before we get started? No, thank you. Okay, good. Um, first step, I randomly choose. That's strange looking due to the virtual background. Um, who's goes first? And um, it is Mr. Bell. So, our first question for you, Mr. Bell, uh, what work or other experience have you had that will particularly qualify you to perform the duties of a judge on this court? You have one minute. Okay. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for this opportunity. Really, truly appreciate uh, the ability. We don't, as candidates, often get to, to speak to such a large audience, and, and we do appreciate it. Uh, I'll start from uh, earlier on in my career. I was uh, a law clerk for the Federal Public Defender's Office throughout law school and a private criminal defense attorney as well, Robert Dixon. And then uh, after uh, passing the bar, did a little bit of criminal defense work myself, joined the CCDLA, uh, and then joined the prosecutor's office. But before doing so, I was a staff attorney for the judges, which uh, trained me on how to write summary judgments and, uh, and give opinions uh, to help the court. Uh, from there, uh, with the past 29 years of experience, I have not only litigated my own cases, but managed uh, the, the tough cases. So over a hundred uh, jury trial experience uh, and uh, complex litigation, and also a councilman for the city of Solon, which broadened my perspective. So that's my experience in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, and now um, Ms. Wanda Jones, what work or other experience have you had that will particularly qualify you to perform the duties of a judge on this court. One minute. Is that, that's for me, is that? Yes, yes, you're on. Is that for, okay. Uh, the most uh, important qualification is that I actually have been doing the job for almost two years now. I was appointed by Governor Kasich in uh, 2018 so I've uh, presided over both civil and criminal trials. I have done an, an excellent job. I've gotten, I've decreased my criminal docket from 157 cases when I first took the bench to now I started off the month with 138 cases. 
even though we are in the midst of a pandemic, I still have been able to uh, keep uh, working through the cases and getting them resolved. Uh, I am a lifelong Cuyahoga County resident. I was born, raised, and educated here. I graduated from Glenville High School in 1990. I attended Ursuline, received my undergraduate degree from Ursuline College uh, while working full-time and raising kids. And I got my law degree from Cleveland Marshall College of Law. I, this is a second career for me. I have uh, almost 20 years of banking experience. And I think that qualifies me. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I want to assure our panelists that when the comes up, you may, of course, finish your sentence. So thank you. Um, now, uh, then, uh, while we have you, Ms. Uh, Jones, you are the first for the next question, which, for which we will have two minutes. Do you believe that all citizens have adequate access to legal help and the legal system? Why or why not? And if not, what can be done to make it better? Well, certainly I think in the civil realm of things, um, often uh, plaintiffs who are unable to afford counsel uh, end up, rep they attempt in a, a lot of cases to represent themselves and it can be quite overwhelming. Uh, I would like to think that um, that that's a consideration that um, is made when they're attempting to work through the system, but it, it is overwhelming. A lot of uh, the uh, county courts, and I believe the municipal court as well, have started offering pro se clinics to provide some additional information uh, to litigants who are unable to afford counsel. Uh, obviously, in the uh, criminal defense side of things, um, everyone is afforded, they're, if they're unable to afford counsel, counsel's appointed. Um, however, um, I, I can't sit here and say that I think that, uh, that the representation is the same when a person is able to afford counsel because they can afford experts and things like that. Uh, and obviously there's a, a limit on the amount of money that can be spent when the uh, county or the state is paying for those kinds of things. So. Yes and no. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bell, same question. Do you believe all citizens have adequate access to legal help and the legal system? Why or why not? And if not, what can be done to make it better? Two minutes. Um, I certainly believe that we can improve in this area because the perception is, uh, is reality. There are citizens that believe that they do not have adequate representation and that the uh, court does not provide this to them. Some of it might be a matter of uh, public awareness and communicating uh, the, of the resources that are available to them, uh, but we certainly can improve. In the civil area, we need to encourage pro bono work. Uh, people have to have access to an attorney for very important life issues, especially the ones that are going on now. We have eviction issues, we have foreclosure issues, we have probate issues, all which have been exacerbated by COVID-19, this pandemic area, this era. So we need to really make sure that what we're doing is whatever resources we do have, that we're promoting them. So people believe and understand that they do have equal access. Uh, but I don't think that that may be the case. So in the criminal realm, uh, I think that we can increase the assigned counsel fees. I think that that's important. There's always a balance to try to be efficient as well as to resolve your case resolutions, uh, but the uh, stipends that are provided to the criminal defense bar, uh, they kind of uh, pale in comparison to the amount of hours and the work that they do. So I do believe that we can encourage pro bono work and that we can uh, increase the fees, which might uh, then uh, provide more access uh, to individuals. I did uh, get appointed by Justice Maureen O'Connor to the administration of the death penalty the reform initiative. There's a joint uh, uh, Ohio State Bar Association as well as uh, the Supreme Court. And we did in fact uh, pass recommendations that we should have more access and that we should increase the fees on death penalty cases. And I think we can do that here locally as well on normal regular cases. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, next. Uh, 
question to Mr. Bell then. What are your views on whether the court system as a whole deals effectively with biases regarding race, ethnicity, gender, and income? And include in your comments, if you will, uh, uh, your views of the cash bail system. The uh, court system as a whole, again, this, there's part of this is a perception issue. The court system has been engaged in reform uh, issues that have uh, taken place over, over the past number of years. Uh, however, the issue continues to come up uh, through the bar associations as well as through the public. So again, we have to continue to look to see what it is that we're doing and how we might be able to, uh, to do a better job. In particular, the bail issues, our bond structure uh, was higher than it is now. In 2013, I did ask the John and Laura Arnold Foundation for their risk assessment tool. And I think our court might benefit from using a risk assessment tool that truly gets to the point of whether or not somebody has failed to appear only in the last two years. We shouldn't be doing a, a longer look back period. Uh, so I do believe that uh, we, can, we can do a better job there. There are some racial injustices and we need to uh, make sure that we ourselves as judges uh, train ourselves and go to trainings uh, to make sure that any implicit biases uh, do not affect the system. Thank you. Uh, okay, Ms. Jones, the same questions. What are your views on whether the court system as a whole deals effectively with biases regarding race, ethnicity, gender, and income? And comment, if you please, on the cash bail system. Two minutes. Well, as one of only four African-American judges on the, the bench out of 34 judges, uh, and out of, this is the first time there have ever been four African-American judges on the bench at the same time. Uh, when I look at the number of uh, African-American, Hispanic, or other minority uh, attorneys that work in the prosecutor's office, as well as in the public defender's office, um, so when you take the bench, the prosecutor and the public defender's office, uh, representation of diverse uh, individuals is, is missing. It's sorely missing. And uh, if the natural progression of um, a person who wants to be a judge is to come through either the public defender's office after uh, working there or through the prosecutor's office, which is typically the career path, uh, that's something that hasn't, uh, it has translated into diversity on the bench. Okay. Thank you very much. I apologize for creating confusion on the time limit there. The timekeeper off screen corrected me um, for me. So I hope you feel you had enough time to answer that uh, particular question. Um, I was a little bit confused about that. I didn't get to address the cash bell system, but that's all right. All right, uh, let's, um, I think it might fit into my next question if we can, if we can salvage the situation that way because I do wanna be fair here. Um, my next question is for you, Ms. Jones, starts with you. Um, and I think what I'll do is for this question, I'll say two minutes. Um, what have been the most effective methods in recent years for improving court procedures for fairness and efficiency? And what other methods do you think might be used uh, in addition? Well, certainly um, the bail system and the issues around surrounding, I have a lot of uh, bond hearings right now and bond, when a judge sets bond, it's based on the charges in the indictment. It's not based on any evidence because the judge doesn't have any evidence at that time. So one of the, the things that really needs to be addressed and I see it uh, all the time as an issue is the overcharging of defendants on the front end with the idea that at plea or at trial, that's when those additional charges would be dismissed. So uh, until that is a result, Resolved, and until we address uh, overcharging of defendants, a cash a cashless bail system, uh, a changes to the bail system are not going to be effective until that until that happens. Um, one of the most effective things I've done that's made a big difference is uh, Zoom hearings. I think that's created some 
efficiencies. I think it has allowed uh, the court to be able to process cases much faster. Um, attorneys are not having to run from courtroom to courtroom. They can simply be logged on. I've been able to assign counsel on individual, uh, on a, a, a probation violation day. I could get 10 uh, d defendants who uh, are either in jail or at home or wherever at their attorney's office, uh, get those cases handled virtually via Zoom. That's something that even after the pandemic, I intend to continue because it's been very effective and effective in even preventing them from having to come down for pretrials on their cases. Okay, thank you. Okay, no, thank, thank you. you for, thank you for your answer. Um, did you have anything more that you wanted to add? No? Nope, that's it. Good, then. thank you. Thank you. And same question then, uh, Mr. Bell, and again, maybe two minutes. What have been the most effective methods in recent years for improving court procedures for fairness and efficiency? What other methods might you suggest? Well, this, uh, again, this pandemic period has given the court some opportunities to, uh, to become more uh, technologically sound. Uh, I have uh, argued that we should be doing more teleconferencing. We should be doing that for the civil bench especially, but it's now working as well for the criminal defense attorneys and the prosecutors. And now that everybody's comfortable with, with Zooming or teaming, we can certainly uh, continue to do that practice. And I think that's important and it's uh, efficient. It, it really truly affects the lives of the litigants. Uh, they don't have to come down to the courthouse for their safety or as well for just the, uh, the inconvenience. Uh, and if you are assured that somebody's going to show up for trial, we don't need to have the attorneys and need to have the defendants uh, and the victims come down time after time after time to see whether or not they're going to show up. Uh, I think we can uh, calendar and schedule better. Uh, and I think that as long as the parties agree on the dates and the motions and this uh, timing uh, and zooming, I think that'll be fine. Uh, open discovery is something that's very important, not, uh, not just that it's open, but that we understand as judges when it's been provided. Because as soon as you know and, and set a schedule that the discovery has been provided and met, uh, then you can actually start talking about the resolution on the cases. So I think that's another way that we can be more effective. That's an effective method uh, to really watch that uh, aspect of, of uh, what you're doing. And then providing early counsel early on. Uh, is important to be able to address the issue of bonds, be able to address the issue of discovery, and be able to address the issue of whether or not uh, we can resolve cases. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Um, now, uh, moving on and staying uh, with Mr. Bell, we elect judges just as we elect other public officials, but are judges different from other elected officials? How would you explain that to the public? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, they are. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been a councilman in the city of Solon, and so that's, uh, you're in a different branch. You're in the legislative branch uh, with, uh, with the duties to, uh, to advocate for your, uh, for your clients. Uh, as a prosecutor, you're in the uh, a separate branch as well, the executive branch, and your duties to advocate for the citizens of the state of Ohio. But as judges, uh, your duty is to be independent. It's to be independent from any of those other uh, pressures. Uh, and so your role is to uh, make sure that people uh, understand why you're ruling. I think that that's something that is important uh, for the judiciary. We have to explain ourselves and be more transparent. And so the difference for the electorate is that uh, you should be able to scrutinize a judge's and a candidate's uh, experience, but also you should uh, understand that once they take the bench, that they have a duty in order to be independent and fair and let the facts guide their decisions. Thank you. And Ms. Jones, the same question. We elect judges just as we elect other public officials. Are judges different from other elected officials? And how would you explain that to the public? We are absolutely different from other elected officials. Um, when I go into the community um, and I attempt to, you know, engage with um, with the citizens in the community, I 
often I'm asked questions about my opinions or my beliefs on certain issues, and those issues may come before the court. So judges are not permitted to answer those types of questions. And I explain to people that the reason for that is because you never want to give any indication that you would rule in a certain way if that type of case were to come in front of you. So we're very limited in terms of what we can say about you know, a lot of uh, issues uh, that are uh, impacting people today. Um, but one of the problems that has happened, I, as I see it, is that we have turned into uh, this sort of uh, almost like politicians where we have to go out and campaign and we have to try to get people to vote for us. And while we're doing that, um, oh, well, my time's ended, but. Well, actually the next question carries on with that. So staying with you, Ms. Jones, how can we assure the public that judges are independent of special interests um, discuss campaign contributions? One minute. Well, I think one important thing that people should look for is when you see judges out campaigning, if they are m making platforms and saying that they are endorsed, you know, that they are uh, supporters of things like supporters of unions or supporters or endorsing particular candidates, that should be a clue that that, that candidate doesn't understand what it actually means to be a judge. It's we have to be impartial, we have to be fair, and we have to have and we have to give the perception to the community that we are. And you can't do that if you're making political statements. Um, so it's something that you should look for, not everything that the judge is saying, you should be looking for what the judge is not saying and how they are uh, responding to those types of questions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mr. Bell, the same question. How can we assure the public that judges are independent of special interests? Please discuss campaign contributions. Okay. Um, campaign contributions are, it, it's a matter of, uh, of, of fact that anybody that's running that has to put out uh, mailers uh, has to accept campaign contributions. And for the, the public to understand that uh, judges have to fill out uh, campaign uh, fundraising uh, notifications to the Board of Elections. They have to yearly uh, uh, disclose what their campaign finances are. And they have to uh, quarterly, usually before the election and afterwards, explain who they've received those uh, funding from. So in local races like the Common Pleas Court, you mostly receive uh, money from family and friends, people that, uh, that know you. And, uh, and you could, this could become an issue perhaps on a statewide issue if you're a statewide uh, judge, if you're running. Uh, so we need to explain to the court, uh, to the judges, I'm sorry, that uh, nobody should be allowed to take an unfair advantage of the judge. And that's why it's so important that we have open disclosure of who is providing money to us. Thank you. Okay, staying then with Mr. Bell, um, how do you deal with, we're talking about you know, a trial situation where there's a lot at stake. How do you deal with difficult people, including peers, lawyers, clients, litigants, and please discuss this in the context of being a judge? Yeah, I, I thank you for that. Uh, you know, as you're, when you have 29 years experience and you are, uh, in the most difficult complex cases in the county, uh, whether you're uh, trying the Case Western Reserve shooter or death penalty cases, or you're managing those cases, you come in, uh, in front of the judges uh, with some very uh, great pressures and your opponents are under great pressure as well, as well as their clients and the litigants, even in civil cases, especially uh, this impacts their life. So I have uh, had a lot of experience with dealing with charged situations. And as a judge, you have to be patient and you have to listen. You have to make sure that people understand that you know their position. Uh, so you can, if you can, defray some of, uh, some of those uh, difficulties. Uh, it's, it's better sometimes that cooler heads prevail and uh, judges and litigants, uh, uh, if they have trial experience, then they've been through the wars, if you will, and I have. 
Thank you. Now, um, Ms. Jones, then, how do you deal with difficult people, including peers, lawyers, litigants, and discuss this in the context of being a judge? Well, I don't know if it's because I um, am one of the newer judges, but I've actually had this experience. And I will tell you that uh, the length of time that uh, the person was an attorney had no bearing on whether they, I mean, I've had attorneys throw tantrums in my courtroom who have been practicing in that in the Justice Center for oh, well over a decade. So that I don't think has anything to do with it. I think it really boils down to temperament. And I have handled those situations by having a, um, a judicial temperament. The more upset I see people getting, the calmer I get, I slow down, I offer to take a break, uh, and I treat people with dignity and respect and make sure that everyone knows that they will have an opportunity to be heard. And then I listen uh, and I let them speak until they're done. And it seems to be effective. So it's one of the things that I do. And well, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, but I've experienced it on at least a few occasions. Thank you for that. You. And then staying with you, Ms. Jones, what qualities most impressed you in the judges before whom you appeared as a practicing attorney and describe which of these qualities you are working to emulate? Well, I think the most important quality is the uh, judicial temperament and the fairness, uh, the idea that you can't tell which way that judge is going to rule and if they're ruling just from the law. And uh, I, I remember the judges who when asked uh, how this judge is, the first thing out of my mouth is that that judge is a fair judge. And that's what people want to know first. They want to know if they're going to get fair treatment and if they're going to be um, given an equal opportunity to have their side of the uh, controversy or issue heard. So that is something that I set out in, when I first uh, took the bench to have a judicial, um, just a judicial philosophy of fairness procedural justice, and treating people with respect in my courtroom. And I think I've accomplished that. Thank you. Mr. Bell, what quality impressed you in the judges before whom you've appeared and describe which of these qualities you work to emulate? Patience is, is a very important quality. Um, Hardworking, um, being respectful, um, and giving people dignity. Uh, you have to have a knowledge of the law and uh, you have to have a willingness to read case law and briefs uh, and a willingness to just simply listen. There's a, uh, I practiced in front of 70 different judges and uh, you seem, you get to learn their uh, idiosyncrasies. You get to learn uh, what's effective or not. Uh, but the ones that I admire the most are the ones that uh, give you the time and are willing to listen and, and don't think that they're the smartest person in the room. Uh, they have to have a good temperament uh, and they have to uh, be willing to, to listen. And let the facts guide your decisions and those are the type of judges that I wish to emulate. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I see that our time for this forum has concluded um, on behalf of our debate sponsors, the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, judgeforyourself.com, and the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, and on behalf of the voters who need to make this important choice, I want to thank you both very much for participating. Thank, thank you. you, and I apologize for the virtual background. I could not figure out how to get it off of there. So I'm gonna, <laughs> so I apologize for that, but thank you for having us. And thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the, uh, the uh, ratings provided by the Judge for Yourself. And thank you to the League of Women Voters, CMBA, CCDLA, and the Women's Bar Association, uh, and all the bar associations. Thank you very much.